عليك ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده على آله وصحبه أجمعين Our last session for today will be speaking about uh, another hero from our many heroes which this ummah has produced. Uh, never has a nation produced men and women like the ummah of Islam. And at times hurdles, obstacles, impediments are purposely created between the ummah of the Muslims and their past. So that they never ever are inspired to look back at their past and therefore they cannot use it as a means of revival for their present and for their future as well. This is happening at a time when every other nation in the world is in fact taking pride and honors itself with regards to the men and women which it has produced. However, there isn't any nation on earth that is worthier of this honor and this prestige and this pride with regards to its heritage and past like the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the one who asserted this reality and gave this praise wasn't a Nobel Prize man it wasn't any historian it was Allah the creator of man himself when he said in praise of this Ummah Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas you are the greatest of all nations to have ever been placed forward as an example for mankind and the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say Antum mufuna sab'ayna ummah you, O Muslims, you are the last of 70 nations that came before you. However, you are the greatest and most superior of them all in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By Allah, this ummah has produced men and women that will continue to cause the pages of history to look back at their biographies in awe and admir admiration and astonishment. And one of these people is our hero for today. He was a man who was arguably the leading scholar during his time. And he was a mastermind in the field of hadith. And he was an expert, a champion in the field of fiqh as well. In fact, Ibn Wahb, he would say that the knowledge of our hero for today had even surpassed the knowledge of Imam Malik himself in the field of fiqh. However, his opinions or his madhab did not become as prevalent as the madhab or the schools of thought of the four main schools of thought that we know today. However, despite the lack of a madhab for this man, his opinions are found in every single book of fiqh there is today. He is Sufyan al thawri from the Tabi'i Tabi'in. He wasn't a companion, nor was he a Tabi'i, but he was from the generation that came, that came after them. I strongly believe, brothers and sisters, that the biography of this man should be part of the curriculum of tarbiyah, nurturing, that we offer to our children. The life of this man is a real example of what it means to practice what you preach. An absolute saint, an absolute washipah, a courageous man who did not fear the blame of the blamers. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, he said, in praise of Sufyan al-Thawri, ما أعلم على وجه الأرض أعلم من سفيان. I don't know anybody on the face of the earth who has more knowledge than سفيان. سفيان بن عيينة says in praise of سفيان الثوري. He says I have never seen in my life a man like سفيان, nor has سفيان ever seen a man like himself. سبحان الله. And شعيب بن حرب. He said in praise of سفيان, إني لا أحسب. I suspect that on the day of judgment, Allah Almighty will bring Sufyan as a proof from Allah against humanity. And it will be said to the people, it is true that you did not meet the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, but you certainly met Sufyan, Allahu Akbar. This is how much of an embodiment of the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, he was. Ya Salam. Imam Sufyan al thawri may Allah have mercy on him, was born in the year 97 after the hijrah of the Prophet وسلم, to Medina. And his father, Sa'id ibn Masruq, was also one of the leading scholars in the field of hadith. So a quick footnote here, brothers and sisters, look at the influence and the positive effect that good tarbiyah, having good practicing parents can have on your progeny. Sufyan did not appear from a vacuum. His father was also a scholar in the field of hadith. 
today, people, they ask, what is the best way we can preserve the future, the Islamic future of our children? We are also aware of the policies and the difficulties that are emerging day after day for those who want to raise their children upon Islamic principles. One of the greatest forms of Islamic insurance, halal Islamic insurance, that is, that you can take out in order to safeguard and guarantee the safety of your children and their principles as believers is the insurance known as your own righteousness. Ensuring my own righteousness is one of the key means in ensuring the righteousness of my children. And you are all aware of the story in Surah Al-Kahf that perhaps you read every Friday. When Al-Khadr was traveling with the Prophet of Allah, Musa, alayhi salatu wasalam, and they came across a community that were very stingy, and they refused to offer them hospitality. And as they were leaving, they came across a wall that was defective. So Al-Khadr voluntarily started to fix the wall. And Musa, alayhi salatu wasalam, was surprised. He says, why will you serve a community who didn't offer us the basic hospitality? And what was the response? This is what I'm trying to get at. He said, أَمَّا الْجِدَارُ فَكَانَ لِغُلَامَيْنِ يَتِيمَيْنِ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ وَكَانَ تَحْتَهُ كَنْزٌ لَهُمَا وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا الله أكبر He says, as for the wall that I fixed, it belonged to two orphans from the city. And beneath the wall, there was a treasure that belonged to them. And their father was a righteous man. So look at the link that Al-Khadr makes, as was documented in the Qur'an, between the protection of the wealth of those orphans and the righteousness of the, righteousness of the father. And that is why Imam Ibn Kathir, he says in his tafsir of this verse, he says, فيه دليل على أن الرجل الصالح يحفظ في ذريته وتشمل بركة عبادته لهم في الدنيا والآخرة he says this verse is a clear evidence that a person who is righteous, Allah Almighty will protect his children on his behalf. And that the worship that he does of Allah Almighty, its blessing will encompass his children in the life of this world and the hereafter. MashaAllah, tabarakAllah. Our predecessors, they understood this. And that is why Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, one of the students of Umar ibn al-Khattab, when he was engaging in his prayer, he would say, to his son, O oh my son, sometimes I engage in prayer and then I remember you. So I make my prayer very long, extra long, hoping that Allah will make you righteous. MashaAllah. Inni la atadhakkaruka fi salati fa azidu fiha min ajli salahik. I remember you when I'm in prayer. So I make it extra long, hoping Allah will make you extra righteous. MashaAllah. Tabarakallah. But it wasn't just the father of Sufyan al-Thawri, who was a wonderful influence, a wonderful influence on his son, but the mother as well. His mother was a remarkable woman. And she played a chief role in the production of Sufyan. And listen to the advice that she would give her son when he was still an emerging adult. She said to him, O oh, Sufyan, اطلب العلم وانا اكفيك بمغزلي. Go and pursue Islamic knowledge and I will finance you through the money that I make, through the spinning and weaving. MashaAllah. And she said to him, when you go and you write down your first 10 hadith that you memorize, stop, pause, wait back, zoom, zoom out, and then reflect on your personality. Oh my son, if you feel that these 10 hadith that you have taken have increased you in knowledge, have increased you in the fear of Allah, have increased you in composure, and they have increased you in patience, then continue. This is knowledge that will benefit you. If, however, you feel that this is knowledge that does not benefit you and has no change in your personality and how you present yourself, then stop and choose a different career for yourself. That is knowledge that will end up harming you. MashaAllah. And I think we have all seen examples of people whom the moment they gain knowledge, supposedly, they change for the change for the worse. This person used to be humble and kind and gentle and now he has knowledge and he has acquired some understanding and now you can't even speak to the person anymore. And he's foul-mouthed and he's backstabbing 
And he's doing it under the banner of what? Enjoining good and forbidding evil. This person cannot be approached by a mother or father, nor by a sheikh, nor by a brother, nor by nothing. And in that situation, you find yourself saying, I wish that you had remained ignorant. You are a better person. And that is why the famous poet, Abi Ishaq al-Ilbiri from Andalusia, he would say in his couplets, إِذَا مَا لَمْ يُفِدْكَ الْعِلْمُ خَيْرًا فَخَيْرٌ مِنْهُ أَنْ لَوْ قَدْ جَهِلْتَهُ وَإِنْ أَلْقَاكَ فَهْمُكَ فِي مَا هَاوٌ فَلَيْتَكَ ثُمَّ لَيْتَكَ مَا فَهِمْتَهُ MashaAllah. He says, if the knowledge that you gain does not increase you in goodness, I wish that you had never gained knowledge. And if your newly acquired understanding ends up throwing you in pits, I wish that you had never acquired understanding. Sahih. That's why our Messenger وسلم, would say in his dua, Ya Rabb, O oh Allah, protect me from knowledge that what? That does not benefit. أعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع ومن قلب لا يخشى. I ask you, O oh Allah, to protect me from knowledge that does not benefit and from a heart that does not submit to you. If your heart is not submitting, my brothers and sisters, as you pursue knowledge, then know very well that the knowledge you are acquiring is not the knowledge that Allah Almighty wants from you. Yes? طيب. Sufyan al-Thawri, rahmatullahi alayhi, not only was he a scholar, but he was also a remarkable worshipper. And this is a reoccurring theme as you are finding now in the lives of these great people, subhanAllah. Ibn Wahhab, he says that Imam Sufyan al-Thawri once made a prostration to Allah Almighty when he was in Al-Haram in Mecca. He prostrated and he stayed in that state of prostration all the way until the Adhan for Salatul Isha was delivered. In one prostration. That's hard and maybe you've tried it and I've certainly tried it and then the blood starts rushing towards your head and you feel that your head's going to explode. But Sufyan al-Thawri, rahmatullah alayhi, he didn't have a problem with that, nor did he experience this because he had trained himself to do abundant prostration. Because he realized that the closest a person can be to Allah Almighty is not by climbing a space shuttle and going upwards, but it is by falling downwards. Prostrating to Allah as Allah says, what? As the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ the closest a person can be to his Lord is when he is in a state of sujood, prostration, Allahu Akbar. Sufyan al-Thawri, rahmatullahi alayhi, was also a man who would daydream a lot. But he would daydream on the right things. Yusuf ibn Asbat, he says, Sufyan al-Thawri once said to me, Nawilni al-Mithara, pass me the vessel to make wudu, the vessel of water. So I gave him the vessel. And he took it with his right hand. And then he placed his left hand under his chin and he began to daydream. He says, I fell asleep. I don't know what he's doing. And I wake, woke up at Salatul Fajr when the sun was now rising and Sufyan was still holding the water in his right hand and reclining with the left. He said to him, Imam, you're still in the same situation I left you hours ago. He said, yes. I just was a bit busy thinking about the hereafter. Allahu Akbar. Thinking about the hereafter the entire night. Yes, Allah. If we were to list the top 10 forsaken acts of worship, perhaps this particular act of worship is up there in the top three. The act of worship of contemplation and deep thought over Allah Almighty and the home of the hereafter. The wife of the companion Abu Darda, she was asked, Ayyu ibadat Abu Darda kanat akthar? Which act of worship did you see your husband Abu Darda, the companion, engage in the most? What did she say? At tafakkur wal i'tibar. She said, deep thought and contemplation. You know, sometimes when somebody gives us a gift, it could be insignificant in its price, but we say, you know what, it's the thought that counts. What impresses you is that you had passed through the mind of this person who got you the gift. If, however, you come to learn that the gift was accidental, it came your way by chance, and you were not the intended recipient, all of a sudden the value of that gift plummets in your eyes. Yet, because it's the thought that counts. Why do we excuse Allah Almighty from this rule? وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَىٰ And to Allah belongs the greatest example He too loves to be thought about. And it's one of the dearest acts of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Not only are we required to move our bodies in the worship of Allah, we're required to exercise the mind and move the mind as well in contemplation over His majesty and greatness. To look into the heavens and say, praise be to the one who carries these skies without pillars. Praise be to the one who carries tons of water, tons of rain within clouds that are not even tangible. Soft and delicate. How? No iron, no pipe work, no tanks. Praise be to the one who is protecting the sky at the moment and keeping it so stable and calm, but a, ta a time will soon come when the colors of the heavens will begin to change and when they will crack open, paving the way for the arrival of the angels and then the arrival of Allah Almighty in preparation for the judgment on the day of standing. Yeah, we are required to exercise the thought in this manner and Allah has reprimanded those people who walk the earth and they don't think over His signs. Didn't Allah say, وَكَأَيِّمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ يَمُرُّونَ عَلَيْهَا وَهُمْ عَنْهَا مُعْرِضُونَ How many signs are there, Allah says, in the heavens and the earth that they pass by and they completely turn away from them. Ya Allah. Ya Allah. So this was another aspect of the greatness of Sufyan. He was a person of thought and contemplation. Abdullah ibn Abdan says that his father said that there was a man who used to follow Sufyan. And he says every now and then I would see Sufyan put his hand in the pocket and he would take out a box made out of stone. And he would open up the box and he would take out a bit of paper and he would look into it. And then he would put it back into the box and slip it back into his pocket. And then a bit of time would elapse and he would do the same thing. He would take out the paper and look into it and then he would put it back into his pocket. The man said, obviously, I became very curious and I wanted to see what was written on this paper. He said, I managed to take a sneaky little peek over his shoulder one day when he took out the paper and it said, Oh, Sufyan, remember that you will have to stand before Allah. Allah, 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 subhanAllah. You know why this is amazing, brothers and sisters? Because there is a certain category of Muslims and we are all victims to this from time to time. Who will not snap out of their sins or bad habits only when a third party gets involved and reminds them? So it could be that this person engages in a certain sin for, for, for the entire week, but then when you hear the khutbah on Friday, you decide to change. Or you wait for a lecture to hear and then we may decide to change. Or a beautiful verse from the Quran that we hear and then we decide that we need to make that change. Our predecessors, they didn't do that. They did not wait for a third party to get involved and to take control of the hereafter of other people. They didn't wait for people to do that. They were the ones who were reminding themselves, speaking to themselves, talking with themselves. You know who else used to do this a lot? Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers, Umar. Radiallahu anhu. Anas says, I was once walking with Umar and then we came across an orchard. So Umar, he entered the orchard. Anas said, from the other side of the wall, I can hear Omar talking to himself. Yet we would say this person was insane nowadays. Yet because we don't maybe understand this level of piety and self-consciousness and self-analysis. He says, I heard him from the other side of the wall talking to himself. What did he say? He said, Omar ibn al-Khattab, Amir al-Mu'mineen, bakhin bakhin, latattaqiyanna Allah ya Omar aw la yu'adhibannak. He said, Umar ibn al-Khattab, you're now the leader of the believers. And you obviously think that you're something great, don't you? Oh, Umar, wallahi, you either fear Allah or he is going to punish you. SubhanAllah, talking to himself. Yes, so brothers, what we take from this and sisters in Islam, don't place your hereafter in the hands of somebody else waiting for them to guide you to Jannah. But you be that person who is aware of his faults and her faults and myself as well, and you be the one who reminds yourself. Don't wait for the initiative from anybody. It could be through a paper that you keep in your pocket like Sufyan, or it could be a background that you change on your mobile phone that reminds you of Allah. It could be a lecture that you always keep your ears plugged in to and from work. It could be anything along those lines. Allah says, man is certainly most aware of his own faults. Allahu Akbar. Sufyan al-Thawri, rahmatullahi alayhi, would also meet a person called Abu Bakr 
ابن عياش أن أبو بكر ابن عياش he would say إني لأرى الرجل يصحب سفيان فيعظم I have seen that the people who accompany Sufyan they become great merely walking with Sufyan and getting to know him you become great subhanallah so not only are sins and bad habits contagious but alhamdulillah greatness as well and righteousness that is also contagious but maybe we speak a little bit more about the former as opposed to the latter have you ever heard of something called uh, foot binding this is in reference to an old Chinese practice whereby they used to apply painfully tight binding on the feet of girls and it would prevent the foot from further growth so the body would grow but the foot would stay 12 centimeters or so and this was considered to them back then as a form of beautification for the girls why do I speak about foot binding and what is the re relevance to the statement of Abu Bakr ibn Ayyash who says I see people who meet Sufyan they become great sometimes it could be that the potential one of us may reach in terms of his relationship with Allah and the grade that you can get in the hereafter sometimes it is capped sometimes it is limited sometimes it is bound because of the people we, ch we choose to walk with because of the people we choose to walk with so you can attain Al-Firdaus Al-A'la the highest garden in paradise but because of the people we are with and their low ambitions we never really attain it that's not foot binding. That's not your foot that's being prevented from further growth. That's iman binding. That's your hereafter being limited. If you want to know the type of person that you're going to be within 10 years down the line, all you and I need to do is take a quick glance around the people at the people whom we choose to associate ourselves with. And that will give you the best idea of the type of person you will be a few years down the line. So let us find the likes of Sufyan in our communities. Alhamdulillah, they are many. And let us associate with them and mix with them and be tagalongs and force ourselves to be their friends, lest we may also become great like them. Finally, brothers and sisters, I want to conclude to speak about the death of Sufyan. Rahmatullahi alayhi. He would die around the year 161 AH. Ibn Mahdi. He says, I was next to Sufyan spending the evening with him when he was passing away and breathing his last from the life of this world. And he was crying profusely that evening. I said to him, Imam, why are you crying? Do you fear your sins? Sufyan, he picked up a stick from the earth. He said, my sins are more insignificant in my eyes than this stick. In other words, I know that I have sins, but Allah is merciful. Allah Almighty pardons. He will pardon me, inshallah. He says, however, inni akhafu an uslab al-iman. I am afraid that iman will leave me before I die. Allah. What is the ruling of a person who fasts a long 19-hour day and then purposely nibbles on something before the sun sets? That long day of fasting is void. And similarly, a person who may fast a lot, uh, may pray a long prayer, and then remembers that wudu is not intact. Even if the prayer is long, that prayer, it has to stop. Similarly, what is the ruling of a person who worships Allah Almighty for 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, and then just before you die, you are derailed from the path of Iman and you die without Islam. Those 70 years are gone. Ya Allah. But there is a question here that poses itself, isn't it? How can that be? Worshipping Allah Almighty all those years and then I am pushed off the track just like that? God forgive me, is this even fair? That's a question that comes through our minds. Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali says in his book Jami' al-Ulumi wal hikam a beautiful statement that gives us the answer to the missing link and he tells you what went wrong. He says in a very beautiful sentence, إِنَّ خَاتِمَةَ السُّوءَ he says the evil ending not being able to die upon Islam is because of a hidden defect within the heart of a person that people do not see. That is what pushed them off the path of Islam before they die. You see how it links in with the lecture before this when we were speaking about the amana, the amana of accessibility, the amana of your actions in secrecy, 
He says there was a hidden defect that people didn't see, but it showed up when you were dying. Like a car that you drive at 30 miles per hour and there was a defect in the engine, the defect will not show up. But the moment, the moment you start driving and you take the car for a ride, what happens? The engine buckles. Similarly, there may be many people who live outward lives of righteousness for 60, 70 years, but when they die now, when they are tested by the angel of death, and he starts pulling that soul out of your body, this is when the defect shows up. Abdul Aziz ibn Abi Rawat says, I was once sat next to a person who was passing away. And we were saying to this person, Say la ilaha illallah, say la ilaha illallah, make sure you die upon Islam. And then suddenly he spurted a statement that is very bad. He said, Huwa kafirun bima taqul. I disbelieve in everything you are saying. And then he died. This, one, this was a Muslim man. Abdul Aziz said, I went crazy when I saw this. So I said, I have to investigate his life. Something made him say that. And he did his investigations and he found out that this man was an alcoholic. Therefore, Abdul Aziz would say after this, beware of sins, brothers and sisters, because his downfall was because of sins. Yes? If you are a person who wants to know what you will be heard saying on your deathbed, the answer to this is the exact same things that people hear you saying today. If you want to know what your main and your prime concern will be on your deathbed, the answer to this is the same thing that concerns you today. If you want to know what type of person you will be on your deathbed, the answer is the person you are secretly are today. The person you secretly are today. Ibn Kathir, he says, and I will leave you with this, in al karima قَدْ أَجْرَ عَادَتَهُ بِكَرَمِهِ أَنَّهُ مَنْ عَاشَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ مَاتَ عَلَيْهِ وَمَنْ مَاتَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ بُعِثَ عَلَيْهِ Allah the Almighty, the most generous, has displayed his generosity to us once again. And he has decreed that whoever lives upon something will die upon that thing. And whoever dies upon something will be resurrected upon that thing. I ask Allah Almighty to give us all the ability to die upon the statement of Tawheed, the statement of La ilaha illallah, and to forgive our sins before the day comes when we stand in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.